And we are live. Welcome, everybody, to AB Live. My name is Miguel Connor. I am your host and pompadus of Gnosis, as I like to say. And very excited to see you, everyone. Now, people are going into the chat. It's Thursday night, middle of summer. So life is good. And today, we definitely have a special show. All shows are special, but these topics tonight are near and dear my heart and our guest definitely brings a lot to the table so with us tonight we've got De dr david litwa david it was very nice to have a conversation with you sharing i had coffee you had beer i think in chicago face to face and it was a great evening but this is almost it's not as good but i'll take it but thanks for coming back on the show Definitely, Miguel. Um, warm hello to you, to, to everybody, Vance, Moondog, and the dog behind Miguel. It's great to be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's behaving. She's behaving. And with us, yes, we've got the Moondog. Vance, how are you doing today? I'm just fine. I'm uh, really um, interested in Marcelina. It sounds like a very interesting character. Just the kind of person I like to get to know a little better. 2,000 years later. <laughs> minus a couple yeah yeah no she's she's amazing as uh david calls her superwoman and we want to find out why she is a superwoman and this is from david's new book and i read it this week and i truly enjoyed it the book is right here for those of you who can see it carper crates marcelina and epiphanes three early christian teachers of alexandria and Rome. And uh, like I was telling David, there's also a very cool, I think, bonus section where he deals with uh, Mystic Mark, or as it used to be called, Secret Mark. Uh, Morton Smith's either his great big joke on the world or some sort of arcane text. David takes us down that path and he has his own conclusions. If he wants to give away spoilers, I'll let him do that. But great arguments. So, um, so what, David, what did, and again, you were recently to talk about The Evil Creator, which was another great book, a great interview. So tell us about this book. Like you said, you wrote it while you were in that endless lockdown in Australia. Is that, tell us about the, the rest of it. Yeah, it was a bit of a Gnostic prison, 266 <laughs> days of hard lockdown. Um, <laughs> welcome to democracy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I was very grateful to have the time to, to write this, and I was very mindful that no other monograph-length book on Carpocrates had been written to date. Um, there was a 55-page German pamphlet published in the 30s, uh, which was the longest, but nothing on Carpocrates, and Carpocrates is so important for all, I think, students of Gnosis and of early Christianity and of just human uh, faiths in general to know about. He is unfortunately also the most pilloried and attacked as one of the most licentious of all. In fact, the king of licentiousness, the the wild sex orgy, uh, you know, mastermind, uh, who has been essentially uh, slandered in all sorts of heresiological literature. And then modern historians and people on the internet continue to repeat those slanders as if they were historical fact. Um, I found, and I put, it, I put it in the book, but I, in reading the encyclopedia entries on Carpocrates, you find some wild and outdated stuff, including stuff that is just purely made up. Um, so <laughs> what I do, I mean, it's a very simple book. I just bring us back to the sources and, and show what we can and cannot know. And of course, I've got my own inter interpretation. People feel free to disagree. But basically, I've got an introduction bringing up the history of research from Nazi Germany in the 30s until the present day, then I start with our only known actual Carpocratian surviving source. I 
I don't methodologically, I don't start with the heresiologists because that is a big mistake. Uh, I start with the actual words of a Carpocration, and the only words that we have are about a 520 word quote from Carpocrates' son, Epiphanes. Then I talk about the heresiological reports, then I talk about Mystic Mark or the Epistle to Theodore, and then I bring it all together in the conclusion, profiling the Alexandrian context, as well as Carpocrates, Epiphanes, and the most famous disciple of all, yes, Superwoman, Marcelina, the only known, and I repeat this ad infinitum because it's so important, she is the only known female leader of a Christian church in Rome in the second century. I mean, really in, in the first or third, but she is entirely unique as leading that movement and bringing Carpocratianism or Carpocratian Christianity, as I like to say it, to the heart, the beating heart of empire, and making sure it made an impression that lasted all these thousands of years. Wonderful. Yeah, and you do a great job, and that's for sure. Uh, for the audience, again, I'd uh, make sure you write your questions. Uh, we will probably tonight only take... Uh, uh, whoever super chats towards the end, towards the end, as we are a little bit strapped for time, but we will try to get to your questions. So, so yeah, that's even. I mean, Carper Crates is a, it's an odd paradox, which I always thought when I first started studying this, David, because on one end you have this sort of uh, individual, this deep thinker who definitely vibes main lines of Stoics and the Cynics, and he's Platonizing. He's almost got an Eastern vibe of detachment and difference. At the same time, he's out there like Led Zeppelin or Wilt Chamberlain and tour, you know, just orgies and sex magic. You know, even Crowley is said to have based a lot of his, uh, his, his mass and a lot of his ideas on the Alexandria perverts, if you would. So why don't we separate the myth from the man, as Judas says, and Jesus Christ, superstar, and you all will see where we'll be. Uh, yes, the orgy and the sex magic. Uh, what's the truth that you think, David? Well, again, you've got to start with Epiphanes, uh, who's both the son and the disciple of, of Carpocrates. And Carpocrates, or sorry, Epiphanes writes a book called On Justice. Wait, before you do that, there's a quote that made me chuckle in your book by sure. a recent Christian historian. This is what he thought of uh, Epiphanes. <laughs> and you're even like, bless your heart, you know, a nasty-minded, adolescent of somewhat pornographic tendencies, church historian Henry Chadwick. Yes, a stuffy Englishman of the uh, 40s and 50s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> who uh, has, still has an influence today. This quote is often quoted, some people who agree with it, some people who obviously disagree with it for good reason. I think anyone who has read Epiphanes, um, and you have to read him through Clement of Alexandria, uh, I think anyone who's read that material um, can't possibly uh, think of him as pornographic. He writes just as any other philosopher would, and he like uh, Plato, but also like Zeno the Stoic and Diogenes the Cynic, writes a book called um, On Justice, uh, or on, in the case of Plato, also called it the Republic or Politeia. And in this experiment, this philosophical experiment, sort of, uh, you have an ideal society portrayed and Plato famously portrayed his ideal society as we don't want any marriage. We or, or essentially what he said was I we want group marriage or what in the States, I guess we call plural marriage after the moral, Mormon uh, practice. But basically you have a society in which no one, no two people are bound together for life, but all men are bound together to all women and they, proceed to have sex by a series of allotments that are controlled by the government. And this was Plato's grand idea. Um, and then the children that are produced from those unions are uh, the 
everyone is their parent, essentially. They don't have two parents. Everyone in the state is their parents. And this vision of society where men didn't own women was then repeated by Zeno the Stoic and Diogenes the Cynic. And we find it also in Epiphanes, our early Carpocratian Christian. And he says, yeah, that we live in a society where we shouldn't own anything. That owning something, the basic idea of capitalism, owning something is, is ontologically and, and, and ph philosophically wrong. We don't own anything. We die. We, we are born into this world and we die with absolutely nothing. This idea of ownership is a human convention, which almost always creates injustice in a society because people own you know, much more than anyone else and people own people. Mm -hmm. And in, in his day, it was slavery. And also with, with husbands and wives, I mean, obviously uh, no one in the ancient world ever said, you know, I own my wife, but that's how they often treated her. She became a sexual object in which her sexuality was restricted and reserved entirely for the husband and you could kill another man who threatened the sexuality of your of your wife mm -hmm. because you you owned her her body so to speak and what epiphany said it was that this whole system this whole system is is wrong this is is based on human convention and the society in which we ought to live is much more like the society in the, in the book of Acts, that ideal picture of Christian society where no one owns, no one owned anything. Okay. And that includes women, slaves, children, etc. So the, the idea that when Moses says that you should not lust after your neighbor's wife, mm -hmm. Epiphany said that that was ridiculous because that that assumed that the wife was just like a possession, like your neighbor's ox or your neighbor's uh, house or your neighbor's slave. So that very idea presupposes humans possessing humans or possessiveness in some way, and that must be wrong. Therefore, this particular mosaic regulation must be wrong. Now, Clement, when he reads that, thinks that what Epiphanes is saying is that you sh you can commit adultery, basically. <laughs> and he accuses Epiphanes of saying that, you know, we can now just have orgies with everyone. But in fact, Epiphanes never, never says that, and nor do we have any evidence that he set up any sort of commune. Now, I should say, it's perfectly fine if he did. That experiment has been run throughout the history of uh, oh. religion. Okay, that, I mean, famously, the Shakers did this in the in the states. Um, but you know, we have no evidence that Epiphanes ever ever, you know, had sex with anyone. Frankly, um, I mean, he died at seven at the age seventeen. Okay, he was the son of one mother. Uh, uh, her name was Alexandria, and she, Alexandria, was married to Carpocrates, and it's never said that Carpocrates had any other ladies in the vicinity, and Marcelina was almost certainly unmarried, and she's never accused in any respect whatsoever of being sexually profligate. So these heresiologists are really pulling something, essentially, out of their own rear end, as far as I'm concerned, when they uh, are saying that they are, there are these mass sex orgies. And what they're doing, I think, is they're taking a very common criticism of all Christians and then scapegoating the Carpocratians, saying that, oh, well, you guys, yes, you guys think that we, uh, you know, F our mothers and daughters in, dar in the darkness of night in the Eucharistic ceremonies. Actually, that's just these Carpocratians over here. So that, I think, is, is the logic of what's going on. It's a scapegoating logic. Now, that's not to say that maybe Epiphanes would have approved of a plural marriage if he had the power. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not excluding that, nor am I saying that plural marriage is necessarily something 
licentious. I mean, I don't apply any kind of value judgment here, but I just look at the evidence and what we have, and I don't see a whole lot of evidence for anything that the heresiologists say when it comes to orgies. Well said, and like, yeah, like you say in your book, if they, if Marcelina had even stepped out of line or even shown her ankle on the street in ancient times, they would have <laughs> pounced on anything because that's what you did to women. You try to vilify them as soon as they kind of get in. They don't. Even, they had. They got nothing on Marcelina that they can use, or they would have used it. So, and uh, yeah. it's amazing how they. Yeah, how uh, Epiphanes is creating this sort of communist anarchist thing. I always find you know the Stoics and the Cynics because. As somebody said, if you take Karl Marx to his natural logical conclusion, you get to anarchism. Every worker creates, there is no state. And it's fascinating that, you know, 2000 or more years ago, there was these thinkers trying to promote this. So it's uh, it's fascinating. So what about the other polemic against Karl Crates and his followers, which was the black the black magic what do you think of that summoning demons and all this other you know harry potter stuff <laughs> well i think i think it's perfectly um it's perfectly fine if you want to say that an early christian group was summoning lower spiritual beings yeah. um i mean in fact this is what early christians do all the time um i mean some of them do it today some of them pray to angels today i mean uh, or saints or whatever and they they then do magical operations um but the question is i think more of a value judgment i mean we don't you know magic was against roman law okay you could be killed for doing it um we don't have those values i mean magic is just fine magic is harry potter <laughs> I mean, <laughs> But there's also white and black magic. And I think, um, you know, I think what we're dealing with here is mostly or almost entirely what I would, I guess, in a popular sense, just call white magic. Um, they might have used dream divina divination. Uh, they might have invoked lower spiritual beings to get messages about the future perfectly fine. Everybody's doing that on the street. Everybody's doing that, Christians and non-Christians. That's just how they think. But then the question is, what then are the heresiologists doing? Well, they're, they're again, they're twisting a knife there and saying, well, well, if you're calling on lower spiritual beings, those must be all evil demons, right? And you, if you're using some magical practices, you must be using all of them. So they must be, you know, using love charms and erotic spells and uh, calling on nasty demons and people who have died violently and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, that's not, I, again, there's, there's just, no, just no evidence of that whatsoever in terms of what you read in Epiphanies, okay? And in Marcelina, you, you never see her or Epiphanies talking about that stuff at all. It's just not, it's not important to them. And I highly doubt that they used erotic love magic because their whole goal in life was to follow the imitation, was to imitate their understanding of Jesus. And Jesus was the man who had conquered his passions. And so if you conquer your passions, uh, it doesn't make much sense to try to excite those passions through the use of potions and incantations. Now, I can't absolutely exclude that they might have used that stuff. I mean, love is love, right? I mean, you know, let, <laughs> let a thousand flowers bloom. I, they, these people aren't against sex, obviously. Okay, so they're, they, you, it's not really useful to call them Gnostics in a kind of Hans Jonas sense. They don't have any problem with the body. They don't have any problem with sex. They don't have any problem with... Uh, they don't have a yell to bail. Um, so they, they are... Uh, just their own, their own pe people, um, and doing their own thing, and doing divination. And at one point, Irenaeus says that they were using healing practices and uh, doing divination through young boys. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So was everybody else. <laughs> was there any Neoplatonic influence on on uh, you know, Carpocrates or Marcelina, where they you know, 
maybe there's a tie-in there because uh, you know Socrates, uh, Diamond, and and all the Greeks were into things that church fathers may have uh, frowned upon that sound like their criticisms. Sure. Well, yeah. So we're we're pre-Plotinus. Uh, so I wouldn't call it Neoplatonism, but you're absolutely right. So you're you have a daimon. Uh, I mean, Carpocratians are deep thinkers, and they're they're in, they're interested, and they know the Platonic sources. So they definitely know about daimones, and daimones for the Platonists aren't necessarily evil at all. So that's what I mean by lower spiritual being. They aren't. Uh, they aren't demons. You know, they're friendly. They're nice. They might be a little bit tricky, uh, a little bit spunky, but they're nice beings. Nice to get to know. Exactly. <laughs> the other uh, polemic would be with the Carpocratians. It should be mentioned that they were universalists, so everybody makes it. Like you said, Jesus was basically the guy who was self-actualized, who, like you said, conquered his passions, remembered all his lives. But Church fathers in occult, as I said, that they thought of the famous uh, redemption through sin, that if I do all these bad things, I'll eventually get saved and go through my life. So can you clarify or tell us your view on how Carpocrates and his group saw reincarnation? Yeah, so Carpocrations, basically, they they bridge. There's, there's fluid identities here. They have both a, a Christian and a Platonic Pythagorean identity. So they fully accept the doctrine of transmigration. They fully see that as part of God's system of justice, that that's, there's no heaven or hell. There's just a system of transmigration. And you've got to go through every experience of life in order to become good, because that's that this world is God's gymnasium. And if you fail your, your gym program, you'll just be sent back to the beginning to try again, right? right. That's the way they conceive God's justice. You'll just be born again into another life until you get it right, okay? And Plato said that, you know, it, you have to be incarnated, he, this is the Phaedrus, he says you have to be incarnated about 10 times to get it, to get it right. And that's if you're only good. I, I mean, if you're really good. Most people need thousands of times. But philosophers, they only need three incarnations, and then they get it right. And the Carpocration theory of, of, of reincarnation was that Jesus only needed one. Mm -hmm. And so that's what makes him special, right? Jesus was a guy with a divine soul, but his divine soul is in quality, not any different than the one that's in you or me. It's just he's the guy who gets it right on one try. It's like... You put him on a bike when he's three years old and he just starts riding without the training <laughs> wheels. I mean, how does this happen? Well, he, that's what makes him special, right? And, and so our goal is to go through life once. And the way we do that is by following the model of the ultimate sage, in this case, Jesus. And that's how we go through every experience of life. Now, it's still a mystery what exactly they meant by that term, okay, going through every experience of life. But it certainly did not mean what the heresiologists said that it meant, which is the redemption through sin idea, okay? Right. And the reason why I think we can know that is because, again, all these Carpocratians are trying to follow their vision of Jesus, the super sage. And Jesus, first of all, I mean, the guy doesn't even have sex. He doesn't even seem to like women. I mean, if you're reading the Gospels, I mean, um, he has, he's basically, um, yeah, I would call him, frankly, asexual. I mean, sorry, Dan Brown, but he's, he's not interested in erotic relationships. He is a man who has mastered his passions. So he's in control. He doesn't experience violent emotions like greed or anger or hatred or jealousy. He has none of that. He's totally conquered that. And he goes through life like that, experiencing all reality in a single go. And that's the model. So if a heresiologist comes up and says, well, yeah, okay, we've got to experience everything. Well, that would include sin, right? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, no, it wouldn't because you're following the model who doesn't, go through that. And that's the point. And that's how we know that 
they're the heresiologists slandered rather than reported, or they twisted what they reported and drew the worst of all possible conclusions. And over time, it just got worse and worse and worse. Yeah, I think there's what uh, the saying, Matthew 5.25, I say unto you, you shall not go out thence until you pay the very last farthing. So <laughs> they, they were, it wasn't that what they were using to say, you got to experience all these lives before you can get out. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so yes, they, they viewed this world, again, as like a, as like a demonic gymnasium mm -hmm. in which the cosmos was controlled by lower rulers. And basically, each of these lower rulers ha was watching over to see if it was essentially doing the grading or the marking, as we call it here in Australia, where, you, you know, did you get that right? And then they tick the box. Mm -hmm. The the daimones look to see if you've performed every single action, and if you haven't, they just send you back into another body. So paying the last penny is doing everything, checking every box, and making sure that you've experienced the fullness of life in order for you to graduate to the supercosmic level. And by the way, this isn't uniquely carpocration. If any of you are familiar with the sentences of Sextus, this interpretation of Jesus' is saying appears there as, as well. So this is part of the, the broader Alexandrian context. But, it, but this passage is important because it shows that carpocrations were reading uh, kind of a mixed form of Matthew and Luke. Um, we don't know what they were reading, but they, it's not from Matthew. It's, it's some sort of mixture. Mm -hmm. So... It's a bit of a mystery. All right. You see that dog? You could be a human. A few more tryouts. You'll, you'll move <laughs> up to a human. Have to lay there I, on the bed bored all I day. I think she would make a pretty good human, but from yeah, what I've she, seen. Um... She'll be running the podcast in the next week. <laughs> Why would she want to go down in the hierarchy, though? <laughs> <laughs> you want to describe the dogs. The cats. <laughs> the cats are above humans, I think. Um, yeah, well, this that's is, a, yeah I'll say one more very brief thing about that is that by the time we get to the first and second century, most uh, Platonists and Pythagoreans are having real trouble with the idea of animal incarnations. And so you'll see a limitation there, whereas Plato seemed to have no problem with us coming into frogs and ants. But by the time of Carpocrates, and I think Carpocrates uh, basically affirms this point, there's no animal incarnations uh, because the human soul, the divine human soul, is only suited for human bodies. And that's why you can eat everything. Whereas a traditional Pythagorean would say, you can't eat meat. Carpocrates says, that's fine because we don't believe animal souls ever reach the cows. No, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, Carpocrates is just fascinating because this fusion of Greco-Roman thought with Christianity and Egyptian thought, it's all its all there. And what about the idea, the other question people were asking too is what about the Jewish law or the idea of angels controlling this earth? What does old Carpo think of that? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. So Clement, when he, when he, quotes Epiphanes, and he sees that Epiphanes is very critical of this specific Mosaic law, which is Exodus 20, 17, that you shall not um, essentially covet, in the old English, your neighbor's wife. And Epiphanes says that this law, its, it's very presuppositions are wrong, because there's just no ownership or human human possession of bodies anyway. So it must be wrong. And what the heresiologists do is they say, well, the entire Old Testament then must be wrong. Um, or Epiphanes rejected the entire Mosaic law. And that, again, is a huge heresiological inference that is just, there's no good evidence for that. All we've got is Epiphanes criticizing that very specific law. Now, however, because Irenaeus says in his report that Jesus rejected Jewish law as human convention, 
that's how we get a fuller picture of the larger critique. And so I'm prepared to say that, yes, Carpo Creations did reject Mosaic law, this, the same thing they accepted. You know, they, they, they rejected Roman law and Athenian law too. And mm -hmm. not, in terms of, not in terms of practice. They, weren't, they didn't then go you know, run around and fuck people or you know, kill people. <laughs> it, it's just that, it, it's just that they, it, it's just like, like we recognize like in, a, in America or wherever you are, or maybe in Russia right now, if you're drafted, there's a draft law for a war that you don't believe in. Well, you don't believe in that law. And so you try to dodge the draft. But if you're not drafted, you just live in that society where you think it's unjust laws. Or I guess now in America today, we could use the, the Roe v. Wade example. I mean, people in America believe that it's a fundamental human right that a woman can make a decision about her body during pregnancy, but they still live in a country where that is now seems to be well under threat. Okay, so they don't agree with the law, but they're not out there being lawless, right? So there's like there's that distinction to be to be made. Um, so that's I think where where carpocrations Carp are. They reject all human laws on principle, but they are not lawless. They believe in divine justice and they pursue justice in imitation of what they see in, in Jesus and other sages, Pythagoras, Plato, et cetera. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. And, um, well, why don't we talk about uh, Superwoman Marcelina herself? Uh, definitely overlooked. Uh, she was, well, I think you say nobody really even says she was a Carpocratian, but she opened a church in Rome to house Carpocratians or teach Carpocratians? Or how is it? How did she get to the, a long trek from Alexandria to Rome? Yeah, we wish we knew more about her early stage of life. But it, from what we can infer, and it is an inference, but I think a good one, it's that she was with Carp Carpocrates in the late 130s and 140s and early 150s in Alexandria. She learned... Carpocration lore, and then she went out as a recruiter based on her own authority and as, a, as an apostle in a looser sense, as someone who is sent, and she went to the imperial capital, and she successfully recruited a whole bunch of Christians there to join her specific, specific group. And this is my favorite not, uh, line from Irenaeus. The way that Irenaeus describes her recruiting process is she exterminated many people. Um, <laughs> and so we know she was successful because she gets many people to join. She's probably fairly rich. She's not attached to a husband. She can afford her own home, have her own home church, start her own rituals. And we know part of those rituals were the veneration of a picture of Jesus, which they thought was commissioned by Pilate. So it was accurate down to the very details, uh, the very fine details. Uh, she sponsored a, a baptism of fire after your water baptism in which you'd get a brand mark on the back of your right ear, indicating that you had been baptized in fire. She also called her group Gnostics. And I highlight this because this is very important for the whole Gnosticism question. Irenaeus very clearly says, uh, and in fact, he's most clear of all when he gets to the most Marcellinians, he says, Gnosticos, uh, they call themselves Gnostics. Now, he says this actually of, of no other group, okay? Not even the so-called Sethians. Uh, that's, you know, a matter of scholarly interpretation when you get to uh, chapter 11 of, of uh, book one of Against Heresies. But in chapter 25, when he gets to the Carpocrations, he's clear as day that the Marcellinian group in Rome from which he's getting his information, called themselves Gnostics. 
And what do they do they mean by that? Well, it doesn't mean that that was their only or their specific name, but it was part of that common Christian claim in the second century that they were the deep knowers. They were the enlightened ones. Okay. I think that their primary name was Marcellinians because that's what Celsus and others told us. Or you could call them Carp Carpocratians. At one point, they're even called Harpocratians. There's some kind of confusion about what to call them. But they definitely did partially call themselves the knowers. And that's really important that they are one among many groups who are taking that name Gnostic and adapting it for themselves, even though other people are calling them other things. So Marcelina is, I think, herself, Celsus calls her a redder uh, or a sophist, sorry, a, a sophistria. And that's, the, that's a female orator. He says that she's a siren. A siren is from Greek mythology. I hope everybody knows it, you know, from the Odyssey. But what, what it means here, I think, at, at, at the very least, is that she was very, not personally attractive. I mean, I don't know what she looked like, but her message was attractive. And she was a powerful speaker. And she must have been to recruit in the imperial capital as a woman without any of the rights that, you know, are available to women today. And so she must have been an incredibly intrepid lady uh, to have so much success in the imperial capital where Christians and everybody else are fighting and clawing their way to get, you know, a clientele. She like, like in those days, making it as a rock star in L.A. or a painter in New York City, you know, if you can make yeah. it there, you can make it anywhere. Rome. Absolutely. Charismatic, right? Yeah. She must have been. And again, we have to go through inf inference, but she must have had an incredible intellect and must have been an incredible speaker. I'm going to assume she was hot. I'm sorry. But I, <laughs> my fantasies and I will, those are mine. Well, you get the baptism of fire. That's hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, she can get behind my love any day, baby. But, um, uh, and what about the idea that she, again, there's uh, lore that she had the original picture of Jesus Christ commissioned by Pilate, but she did use, they, she did use icons. We know that. Yeah, well, that's really that's really striking about her, and and again, it's one of those things that really contradicts, uh, you know, this like classic, I guess, portrait of the quote unquote Gnostics is that they're they're body haters. Well, Marcelina must have, in some sense, loved the body, and she was very interested in Christ's body and his physical features, and so she's the only known Christian who said in this early period that she knew exactly what Jesus looked like. I mean, exactly. Kenny Loggins, um, Michael McDonald, maybe, <laughs> Barry Gibb, I don't know, I'm just kidding. So, and, you know, I mean, it's a great shame that that picture was was lost, but yeah. I, I, it was venerated alongside pictures or small statues of Pythagoras and Plato. Now, she made no claim to have ac accurate depictions of those guys, but the reason why these, these people are important is yeah, because they incarnate the souls that are super sage kind of souls. And in fact, Epiphanes was deified because his father, Carpocrates, thought that he also had the sage or the soul of a super sage. He died at 17, which in Greek reckoning might have been 16, actually. But he was already writing philosophical treatises that, you know, people didn't write until their 40s or 50s. So obviously, Carpocrates thought that there was something divine about Epiphanes's soul, and therefore there was a whole uh, temple and library space set up for him by his parents, who must have been rich and well off on the island of Cephalenia, where his mother was from. Yeah, and uh, wasn't uh, Marcelina also associated, even though she didn't, with uh, some of the, the big-time women from the first century, Mary, Martha, and Salome? Yeah, so this is an interesting little side note, but when Celsus talks about Marcelina, he only refers to Marcelinians, and he seems to break up the group into four different um, 
memberships, which followed apostolic women. He names Mariami or Mary Magdalene, Martha, Sal and Salome. And what I think is here that Celsus, whom I think is probably in Alexandria, um, he probably just got it wrong. And what is really happening is that Marcelina is appealing to specifically female apostles. And Celsus just assumes that, you know, multiple apostles means multiple groups. But I think that Marcelina is our doc best documented evidence for, you know, why we have the Gospel of Mary probably appearing in, in Egypt, why Salome is such an important character in the Gospel of Thomas and in the Gospel according to the Egyptians, which is unfortunately lost. And Martha is really unsung uh, apostolic woman, but she's there too. And uh, actually in later church history, she also becomes famous. But all of these, all of these apostolic women, the person who up upheld their importance was probably Marcelina herself, because she looked back to women specifically as the originators of her own Gnostic or Carpocratian tradition. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, what a, what a groundbreaking person. And moving back to uh, Epiphanes, I wanted to ask you too, because it really helps uh, contextualize the theology, but he had something called monadic gnosis. Could you tell the audience what is this monadic gnosis? Yeah, monadic gnosis, it depends on your interpretation, but the way that I take it, I take it as a reference to the very popular theology of the day, which was Pythagorean numerical theology, in which early, I mean, people who didn't know anything about the Big Bang, but early philosophers and scientists were trying to talk about, well, how, how do we have something come from nothing? Mm -hmm. And they ended up, yeah, basing themselves on the a theory of numbers in which all reality must have stemmed from one single thing, a number, the number one or the monad. And that's how you get multiplied numbers. And that's how you get the proliferation of all reality. And various different groups in philosophical sects take this in different ways, but they all go back to an originally Pythagorean, or perhaps if you like, Neo-Pythagorean core, where it's the monad, everything comes from one, which is so central to their own theory of creation. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I love, uh, again, your book is wonderful. Uh, I love how you start when you bring all these very cool scholars from the 20th century, like Gershom Scholem, uh, Hans Jonas, Simone Petterman, Morton Smith. There were some mavericks back then, and it's fun, like how Gershom Scholem is like, ah, oh, these Carpocratians are like the Frankian Jews, nihilistic Gnostics. So it was, it was kind of a fun time back in the 20th century. You could go to some cool places, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I'm offering on my Patreon, uh, I want to offer, well, several courses or several videos more on Carpocrates, but I, I really want to show people why why Morton Smith loved the heresiological portrait of Car Carpocrates, because he loved, he, he licked his lips whenever he saw licentiousness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that I think that Morton Smith is is probably the real religious nihilist here. And he, in his letters with his teacher, Gershom Sholem, he convinces Gershom that these Carpocratians are, uh, yeah, nihilistic, nihilistic libertines. Mm -hmm. And then it's Sholem who says, oh, well, that reminds me of the Frankists. And then he right. goes on in his book, uh, Major Currents in, in Jewish Mysticism, and mentions the Carpocratians as these yeah, wild, um, nihilistic redemption through <laughs> sin, people, and and that's and then this idea takes off, and Morton loved that. Morton absolutely thought that that was priceless because he liked li that licentiousness, and he ultimately wanted to bring out the picture of the licentious Jesus. And I think all of that is in the mix. You know, Morton's you know hideous smile when all this blows up with this so-called mystic mark. Um, 
there'll be a book uh, on uh, uh, the secret gospel of Mark, I, I think published very soon here from mm. uh, Jeff Smith and, and uh, Brent Landau. But I came up with all my conclusions independently and separately. Um, and I offered to show them the conclusions they um, said no. Uh, so I, I've yet to see what they think about it. But I think, I think the long and short of it is you've got to understand Morton Smith's theology bef before you tackle um, the epistle to Theodore, uh, mm. which is em embeds Mystic Mark. Yeah. Oh, well, Morton Smith, he was, God, he was brilliant. His Jesus the Magician is such a good book. Obviously, it's dated and now it's, you know, freelance spiritualists instead of magicians, but... <laughs> uh, he was a brilliant guy, yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess he had his own agenda, which we all do. It's just a matter if you're aware of it or how it comes out, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not. I don't think it's. I don't think it's bad or good. But I, I do think, yeah, it's it's really important to under understand. Uh, I, I think that Morton Smith was, like many religious Americans. I mean, he was an Anglican priest at one point. Um, he got really, really hurt by religion. And, and he, he left the church and he, he never, ever, ever came back. Um, and then throughout his career, he was always sort of looking over his shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, and in some way, I see a bit of Nietzsche and Raisonnement um, in, in him. Um, which is again neither bad nor good, but I think it's really important to understand. No, I, I mean I, I understand it's uh, we're talking fifties and sixties. It was we think we're where we are today. I mean this is a time where black and white black people couldn't drink out of the same fountains. Uh, being yeah. a homosexual could get you fired, outcast. They were giving lobotomies to gay people in the 60s and 50s. So it was still yeah. pretty dark ages. So I can understand the pain and suppression and like, or I can imagine the horror of somebody like Morton Smith or any gay guy trying to live under, you know, in the dark of things. So it wasn't, uh, it was, we weren't that enlightened. We've, we really have come quite a bit in the last 20, 30 years, so. Uh, but yeah, yeah, now we're getting into social things. <laughs> Where's Epiphanes? <laughs> Where's Epiphanes to save us? So as we, yeah, and uh, for the audience, please check out um, David's Patreon. It's awesome. Like I told him, I love to spend a Saturday night as geeking out instead of watching a movie or anything. I will, you know, I will put on his Patreon. He's got these great videos, 10, 20 minutes, and they're so educational. You know, last one or one of a few was uh, arguments for the gospel of Thomas coming from Egypt. But he goes through all the great Gnostic texts from the gospel of Judas, the gospel of the Egyptians, uh, on the origin of the world was an excellent one. And I love how you showed all the different arguments and then you argue or you use somebody's arguments that it was actually the Ophites who were behind on the origin of the world instead of what most scholars think that it's either a hodgepodge or a Manichaean work, but uh, great argument for the Ophites being behind it. So great videos. And I think uh, you'll learn, you, you will learn a lot. And he puts PDFs with book uh, reviews, critiques and all that. So definitely check out, I will have them on the show notes. And as we get to the end, why don't we take some questions and then we'll wrap it up with David. Advanced Can I just add real quick yeah, something? Sure, sure. Um, so for for those who join the Patreon, this book is ridiculously priced, and I and I understand that. For those of you who join the Patreon, I'm offering a massive massive discount, um, and I will send you this book myself um, in the mail. And so uh, don't worry about that. Uh, Obviously, the Kindle is, is cheaper. The paperback will be coming out in a year. But if you join the Patreon, I can get you a discount. Anyway, go ahead. Awesome. Yeah. Check okay. It out. Um, we actually had one super chat from Occult Fan. Hello, Nathan Lee. Um, now, this is a mouthful. So here I go. Can Dr. Litwa compare the Java Indonesian Indian Tantrika transgressive practices? And are they? Are there any other notable groups, which may include other Christians as well? What groups today embody this? Well, I'm not an expert in that um, 
in the in that material, so I can't directly compare. I I will just say though that um, I don't deny that there are groups and there have been groups throughout time that ha have viewed transgressing human conventions as soteriologically important, that is important for the redemption of their soul or their spirit or wherever, and where open transgressiveness is important. What I am pushing in this book, however, is, is, is that we need to base ourselves on evidence. And that means that we as, as scholars and, and interested readers have a moral responsibility not to repeat the slanderous and bad press of heresiological reporting and convert that into something sweet sounding like redemption through sin or transgressivity or something like that. Again, they didn't in my view, corporate creations did not adhere to any human system of human law. They were entirely for divine law and divine justice. And that must have had huge social implications. But we've got to follow the evidence. And so I think that when you're looking at Indonesia or the Shakers or, or whoever, or the Frankists, I mean, go study the Frankists. Uh, they were there is good evidence that they were, you know, effing each other. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and that's fine. There's no judgment on, on that. I mean, if that's the way they understood their religion and spirituality, yes, there are people who have orgies for religious reasons. But we can't just say that, oh, because, you know, this is sort of like a universal spirituality and that it must have been happening with the Carbocrations. No, we've we've got to follow the the evidence and and take that where it leads us. So I again I apologize I'm not able to make that specific comparison. What about other Gnostic sects like the Borberites, Nicolaitans, or uh, the whole other slew of Gnostics that were accused of uh partying rock and roll all night and party every day like kissing. Do you take them with the same grain of salt or? Well, I think that we always, again, my methodological point here, it, it does apply not just to the Capricrations, but to all of these early Christian groups. And the point is not so much never trust a heresiologist, although you might follow that as a good maxim. But the point is that when you have a primary source from an actual religious devotee telling you what their vision of the world is, you always prioritize that material over the heresiological report. Okay, so, and this is so important because when people want to learn about, you know, these early Christian Gnostics, they turn to Irenaeus as if he's some kind of encyclopedia. And he is probably the easiest to read. But that's an absolutely deadly method. I mean, why would you do that? Um, please don't. Please don't. Um, try to go after the primary sources and see the logic both theologically and in terms of how they viewed salvation before you believe the heresiological report. That's my only ad advice, I guess, um, my plea uh, as, as a scholar. Um, and, and then go where, go where it takes you, okay? In the end, you may disagree with me, which is totally fine. I welcome that. No, makes sense until we get the gospel of Epiphanes goes to Animal House. We just have to do it, or, or something like that. I, and I should say that I have a I have a chapter on the Nicolaitans in my book Found Christianities, so you mm -hmm. can you can get my take on the Nicolaitans directly. I also talk about um, the so called Borberites um, in an academic article, which I am planning to put on on Patreon. So I'm I'm going to give you exactly what I think of the evidence of those people. But I definitely, methodologically, I don't accept 
the heresiological reporting immediately. I You have to study everything around it, find the primary source, check all the facts and data, and then make your conclusion. Makes sense. Vince? Yeah, we just got a uh, another super chat from Vesper. Um, how might carpocratians relate to the therapeutic? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, so I'm I'm actually not not entirely sure there. Uh, certainly, the therapeutic. Um, some people have said that they're a completely mythical group. Some people have said that they really did exist in first century CE Alexandria. They're reported on by Philo. Philo says that they were really, really uh, sexually um, abstemious, uh, that they heard the Mosaic law and they were cool with it. And so I guess the major point of difference would be the Carpocratian community isn't isn't practicing anything of the Mosaic law. Um, or, or if they do, it, it's it's what they see it overlapping with their idea of divine justice. Um, and they are a, obviously they're not a, Carpocratians are not a Jewish group. They're a Christian group. Uh, Carpocratians are also not known for ascetic behavior. They're not divorced from society. They're living right in the center of Alexandria and Rome, which are the two biggest cities. They're highly urban um, and they're highly intellectual, uh, reading Plato and Pythagoras. And uh, so I, I would say that, yeah, there's there's probably a number, a number of in, important differences there. Um, and the other thing is we, we know the Carpocratians definitely did exist. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right. One last one from actually a scholar from Australia, our friend Joanna yes. Kuyawa. Go ahead, Vance. Okay. Uh, Dr. Joanna says, um, they accepted sexuality, but Jesus had to be asexual. And is the old boring presumption that a perfected human has to be asexual? Was that uh, part of the Carpocratian creed? That last well, I guess, I guess I was speaking of my, of my own sort of take on the Gospels. Um, uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I, I don't see, and I could be wrong, but uh, I don't see an erotic element myself. That's not to say that Carpocratians didn't. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I, I, I have to say that I don't actually know. Um, but what I do know of the Carpocratian Jesus is that he is a master of his passions. That doesn't necessarily mean necessarily asexuality, um, but it means that he's in full bodily control and that that was the goal which many ancients strove for. Um, and I think, yeah, in, in Carpocratian society, I don't think they had a problem with marriage. I don't think they had a problem with sex. I don't think they thought that sex hindered them. Uh, that's this is one huge distinction between them and Sethians and other vigorously ascetic groups who think that you know the Diamonds are going to keep you down if you're having sex and bringing up children for the Archons. We don't see any of that in in Carpocratian thought. They just don't have a problem with sex. That doesn't mean that they're sex maniacs, but it also means that they don't fit the Hans Jonas definition of, of, of Gnosticism. They're not world deniers. They're not body haters. They're not marriage deniers. Uh, they love the body. They have a picture of Jesus. They embrace sex and sexuality. And they want to experience everything in the world. So yes, that would include sex. And so um, they believe the physical as uh, um, uh, uh, physical Christ as opposed to just spiritual or illusory Christ. Can't bring up the term, you know, the the heresy where uh, Jesus is just an illusion. That's fine. That's fine. Thank should, you. I think we should just throw out that term. But yeah, I definitely, <laughs> definitely, Jesus, <laughs> oh, Jesus is, Jesus is absolutely a real man. Definitely physical. No, no, not even a hint of doubt about any of that. And Marcelina knows what he looks like. And when her picture of Jesus got destroyed, we lost forever what Jesus looked like. I mean, that was important to her, the physical man. 
And that's something that's really, really distinctive. Where'd the snakes come from? I've been dying to ask that. I mean, they were associated with the snake handling, weren't they? The, the carpocratians? Or am I getting nope. them confused with the um, other, oh, the other group? Oh, fight. Oh, fight. Kiss, kiss the snakes in the mouth, according to. Okay, no snakes for the carpocratians. <laughs> yep, sorry, no snakes. Um, and again, I, I think that this is why the carpocratians are so useful for people for rethinking what you think uh, uh, a Gnostic is. Because, yes, there's no snakes. There is no uh, prohibition of sex. There's no world hating. There's no body hating. There is no y'all to bail. And there doesn't even seem to be many negative rulers hopping around. Um, they seem to live in a pretty bright world where they think that they can live in a just society. And they are, call themselves Gnostics. There you go. They do dream incubation, you know. Um, dream like incubation, the, uh, but that's like so standard. Group. Yeah, I mean, it's like something everybody would do. It's like going to the church and praying. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's there's nothing out of the ordinary for dream incubation for an ancient world, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Awesome. Well, this has been a great discussion. Uh, I think Vance and I are going to hang out to uh, do some house cleaning and a few other things. But David, I know you have to go and I really enjoyed our talk as always. As I enjoy talking to you in Chicago. I enjoy interacting with you on Patreon. David will answer your questions if you write a comment. So he's always there to engage. So uh, check out his Patreon and definitely check out his books. They're just they're excellent. Full of Gnosis. Full of gnosis. So, David, as Definitely. always, thank you. Well, thank you guys. And I really appreciate having this opportunity to get knowledge about this book out. I really believe in Carpocrates, Marcelina, Epiphanes. I think all of these people are super important and super knowledgeable, and that they are still as transformative today as they were so many years ago and it's so important to know who they are and what they represent so i'm so grateful that i can come on and talk about this book and there'll be much more in-depth stuff on the patreon so come join the community awesome definitely check it out yeah support your alternative and independent content creators because that's where the knowledge is and that's where that's how we win this game well, David, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, you're over there and it's Friday. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Yes. Thanks so much. Good to be really with you. It. You too, guys. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Living life every day, late at night, not okay. All I want. And I pray, all I need are some better days Fuck me, I'm looking in the mirror